Okay. Hi everyone, yes. I'm Laura. I'm from St George's Hospital near Neck Leonard and um, I'm going to talk about one of my favourite subjects, uh, parental nutrition. And how do I move slides on? Yes. Uh, so, okay, great, sorry. So this is what I'm going to talk about today. I'm going to talk about why we use parental nutrition, um, a bit of the complications, um, the macronutrients, and a little bit about vitamins. Okay. Sorry. So, sorry. Yeah. Thank you. Hi. Sorry. Yep. Yeah, go ahead. So YPN. So basically, at 24 weeks, um, when you're born, 90% of your body weight is water, and hence the Mars bar that's on this picture. Because imagine that you're born at 24 weeks and you weigh about 550 grams or whatever, 90% of your body weight is actually water. So that leaves you with about 55 grams or a Mars bar worth of actual baby. Um, at term, your body water should decrease down to 70%. And also, in the third trimester, you greatly increase the fat content within the fetus. So it increases from 8% at the start to about 20%. At, um. So basically, if you're born without your third trimester, you start with greatly reduced body stores, and you also start with a limited means to acquire those stores using enteral nutrition, because although your gastrointestinal tract is all there, from mouth to toe, so to speak, um, it's, it's, we all know that it, it isn't working fully, completely at the start. So you can't take the 24 weeker on day one and put 150 ml per day of milk down the NG tube. Okay. Uh, so essentially, um, this slide is to show you the different energy requirements that we have of different phases in our lives. So as, an, as a grown-up adult sitting here, your energy requirement is approximately 30 kilocalories per kilogram per day. If you are a Tour de France rider, you will need about 120 kilocalories per kilogram per day, which is the same as a little baby that's just been born, also needs 120 kilocalories per kilogram per day. So you need about four times more than, than an actual, than an adult. Um, you know, sort of proportionately speaking. And that's really, really important to bear in mind is that your energy requirement is the highest it's ever going to be, um, except for in fetal life when it is higher still. Um, you grow the fastest you ever grow during your lifespan at about 20 weeks of state. But at birth, you are still growing faster than at any other time in your life, and that includes your pubertal growth spurt. Uh, so, why parental nutrition? So we talked about the fact that although the gastric standard practice is there, it's not completely, you know, sort of ready for use. Um, and so we know that parental nutrition is essential in order to make sure that your nutritional deficit is as low as it can be. We now know that PN is also not only crucial for survival, but also for the quality of outcome. Um, so uh, this, this particular study I've put on the slide is uh, from 2011, and, and we had better neurocognitive outcomes for babies with better growth. So the, the, the sort of link between nutrition and better neurodevelopmental outcomes is actually quite difficult to prove because um, your neurodevelopmental outcome is actually the sum total of what's happened in your neonatal uh, experience and not just, doesn't just reflect nutrition. So uh, uh, it's quite a difficult proof, but there is now a good body of evidence which tells us that uh, good nutrition means you have a better shot at being, you know, having a good neurocognitive value. Um, so short and medium term indications are basically the, the major indication for parental nutrition on the neonatal unit is really for those little preterm infants while we are we are getting their guts ready to be able to absorb all the nutrition they need in an enteral route okay um, and the smaller you are the longer that takes um, and uh, basically you are supplying that gap uh, before you are able to establish enteral nutrition 
Um, we also have within our preterm population um, babies who uh, are for whom the gastrointestinal standard pack is unavailable for a short period of time because of neonatal conditions such as NEC uh, or post NEC surgery. And then we also have um, a growing population of babies who have a short gut secondary to um, NEC or NEC surgery. Um, and who have long-term gastrointestinal dysfunction, and that, that is a challenge all of its own. So, um, what is the basics? Well, it's basically made up of water, glucose, amino acids, and a few electrolytes added in, and some vitamins. Okay, that's it. Um, so, it really is really quite simple, but how, the, how it's all put together is obviously a bit more difficult. Okay, so uh, as you all know, we have um, nice guidance on neonatal parental nutrition published in February last year. And um, basically, this is what they state as the indications for parental nutrition. Uh, for preterm babies, they give a gestational age cutoff, i.e., before 31 plus zero week gestation. Um, for babies, after 31 weeks, you can start PN if you're not making enough progress with enteral feeding within the first three days. So you'll notice that this is slightly different from the BAPM guidance, which has both the gestational age and the weight at all. And I think that was the, the nice guidance was really done to try and make it sort of as simple as possible to stop, to, to kind of interpret, um, and also to make sure that um, we, we try to, you know, um, uh, give good nutrition to a bigger population than we possibly could. There will also be some babies, for example, with um, genital gut disorder, um, who are, you know, like, for example, gastric pizzas, who will need parental nutrition from the all. That will be preterm or term infants. Um, when to start? So the NICE guidance tells us that you should start, if you meet the indication for parental nutrition, you should start within the first eight hours of making that decision. Okay, so for example, your 24 week is born and you know at birth you are going to need parental nutrition. The guidance says that you should get it up by eight hours of life. Okay, so the reason that that sort of um, was uh, put like that, uh, let me just see the slides. Okay, is based really on this concept, which is uh, verbalized by Espergan, um, which is that um, basically thinking about preterm birth as a period of transition. So we, we have, as neonatologists in general, moved away from thinking of preterm infants as babies that needed to be resuscitated, rather as babies that needed to be stabilized in a new environment. And um, that holds true for nutrition. So we no longer aggressively intubate all preterm infants, but rather we, we would give a trial of, of CPAP or BiPAP to most of our small parental infants with you know, less invasive surfactant administration. And the same thing holds true of nutrition. Um, we, you know, at, at birth, you have an abrupt cessation of your transplacental transfer of glucose and amino acids. And essentially, the thinking is that you should restart that um, at that intake of nutrients as soon as possible to avoid that metabolic shock that you get. The metabolic shock which they refer to is basically when you switch your metabolism from anabolic to catabolic. Okay. So because if you can imagine as a fetus in the womb, you are said to grow, grow, grow. So you're set to an anabolic. And then as you get born, you abruptly uh, cut that, uh, that connection and you are uh, on, the, on the road to catabolism. You can avoid doing that by uh, starting your PN in a timely fashion, i.e. with an So this is not without... Uh, uh, Okay, let's move it on. Okay. So this is not without its controversy. I'm sure you're all aware of the Pepinic trial, which was published in uh, 2020 in The Lancet. This was essentially looking at early versus late parental nutrition in ill children in a PICU team. And they had a uh, pre-planned uh, secondary analysis of neonatal patients as well, which was included and was also written up as a separate paper. 
And essentially, um, what that paper showed was that the harms of early parental nutrition may outweigh some of the benefits in critically ill children. Um, so the proposed mechanism for this is really interesting, and it's basically um, it's thought that if you give early amino acids, you will reduce autophagy. Autophagy allows a cell under pressure, for example, a cell being starved, to recycle its own components to ensure its survival. So withholding PN can therefore maybe improve autophagy and cell survival. So that's the thought behind why we found what we did in the Pepinic trial. But really important caveats are that the Pepinic trial didn't particularly look at preterm infants, and preterm infants are very diff different from the ill term infants. Um, in, the, in the way that we've just described, they're going through transition rather than being um, sick or unstable. Of course, there will be a subgroup of preterm infants who will be sick and unstable, but if you've been born because of some maternal indication, like an incompetent cervix or something like that, it's nothing, it's not a problem to do with you as a little baby, it's a problem with what happened with the pregnancy, but uh, you know, you need to transition as a preterm infant, not, you know, you, you're not critically ill. Okay, next slide. Um, so these particular papers have been published over the past year from um, from London, so um, I'm sure very many of you will be uh, familiar with them. The first one is from James Webb, uh, which he looked at the early parental nutrition in babies between 30 and 33 weeks gestation, where I think early was defined in the first week and late was defined as in the second week of life. And what they found is um, essentially that um, there was an improved survival in the early PN group, but there was impre uh, increased morbidity in terms of more BC, uh, more BPD, uh, more late onset sepsis. Um, that same analysis was done for babies uh, less than 30 weeks gestation, and similarly, uh, improved survival was found for babies in the early PN group and in the in the very premature infancy. They found this as yeah, within the first two days of life and um, sort of, um, um, you know, in, uh, outcomes in terms of NEC and other things which were less favorable in the early PN group, although early survival. It's really, really important that we don't take home the messages from these papers that early PN for little premature babies is not a good idea, okay, because I really don't think that we can conclude that from the evidence as it is presented there. Okay, I think it, it presents us with an interesting viewpoint and something that needs further investigation. But uh, at the moment, uh, the evidence really is 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 not certain that that's, that later later PN is, is better than early PN or anything like that. And so for the moment, that the the steer would be to go with the guidance of early PN to prevent that met metabolic shock and to and to help with metabolic adjustment for. You are very, very different from the sort of critical, you know, critically ill term infants that we might otherwise see. Next slide, sorry. So, what are the recommendations for starting parental nutrition? So, you start PN on the first day of life within the first eight hours. Um, you start amino acids and you start lipids on the first day. So, amino acids always goes together with glucose, and you progressively increase the amount of amino acids, glucose, and lipids as tolerated. To the maximum lipids, to the maximum limits for preterm and term baby. Um, and then there's a little bit about the fact that you can't give solutions for them to your peripheral line. Well known. There were two major uh, UK PN trials which inform the PN preparations that most of us across London use. And this was the SCAMP trial published in 2014 and the NEON trial published in 2016. And essentially the SCAMP trial was a trial of a sort of concentrated uh, PN solution uh, with a uh, reasonably high amount of acid um, intake. And they showed a beneficial effect on potential head growth in preterm infants. Opposed to NEON, which was a negative study, which basically they looked at high PN, high amino acids uh, sort of uh, intake from the get-go, uh, where SCAMP was a, was a sort of graded increase, um, and they found uh, that there were, was no positive effect on head growth or any other marker for their preterm infants. And so the NEON preparation is the kind of 
sole solution in the neon trial, whereas a scamp PM preparation is a sort of the trial solution, if you like. Okay. So um, how is that divided? This is um, London, and um, I'm sure you can all recognize your networks. There is um, uh, sort of uh, north, uh, central, um, south, and then also northwest. Um, so three quarters of London uses a scamp based parental nutrition prescription, and uh, the, the trial centers where Neon was trialed, i.e., the Northwest uses um, the Neon based preparation for a parental nutrition. Um, this is how they stack up if you look at what's in them. Uh, on the next slide. Um, so essentially, um, you can see the sort of the kind of key difference between them really is that you're able to uh, deliver more concentrated, concentrated nutrition in SCAMP using lower volumes, whereas your volume intake neon is actually reasonably high. Um, um, okay, for the, the, the huge majority of uh, uh, you know neonatal patients who get parental nutrition uh, uh, because there aren't volume constraints, but for some other babies, there may well be volume constraints. For example, if renal function is off or if uh, the baby is not as well as they should be for other reasons. Okay, so uh, yeah, so these are just the two preparations we use across London and also how they, how they, uh, how they look in ingredients. Next slide. So, um, Nice, uh, in their review of amino acid preparations, looked a lot at um, high versus low, um, and they decided that the postnatal intake of amino acids from day two onwards should be between two and a half to three and a half grams, and should be accompanied by a non-protein intake of more than 65 kilocalories per day. I'll come back to explaining that in, the, in a bit of time. Um, so they've also stated that you shouldn't be giving amino acid intakes of more than three points. Next slide. Um, so the problem with trying to assess this evidence um, as part of NICE was that um, most trials vary both amino acids and energy intake. Okay? And there is a non-randomized controlled trial evidence of benefits, but the randomized control evidence um, shows no benefit of high versus low on either short or long-term outcomes. So that make, makes assessing the evidence of um, is it better to have a high amount of acid versus a low amount of acid quite, quite tricky. Next slide. Um, so these are just some of the papers that, that, that people looked at. Uh, Biotini, Rulans, uh, Fire and Bellagimi. Um, and um, basically the, the evidence is equivocal in terms of high versus low. Next slide, please. Um, so, term inf so, so this is where this is how NICE made their recommendation, in that they wanted to have um, a reasonably high amino acid intake, i.e., two and a half to three and a half, but they didn't want to go above three point five because there wasn't any evidence of benefit for a high number. Okay. But in terms of term infants, now if you remember back to the first slide, we talked about the fact that a little preterm infant was a bit like a Mars bar. But if you think about a term infant, it's a really different story because they've had that whole third trimester to grow a whole body. Okay, so there is there they have a lower nutritional requirement. Okay, so um, for term infants, you need a minimum intake of one and a half grams per kilogram per day, and this is actually across the board in order to achieve nitrogen balance for both preterm and term who need one and a half uh, grams per kilogram per day but your maximum amino intake should not in, should not exceed three grams okay and there's also a statement in NICE that says that you consider not giving parental nutrition for home infants who are particularly ill and that's based obviously on the on the Pepinic trial that we talked about a bit earlier. okay next slide so what are the basic building blocks in PN? And that's basically a protein or amino acid, carbohydrates, which is glucose, lipids, and vitamins and trace elements. And this is a nice picture of a normal chaotic neon unit with a PN bag hanging in the hanging in the in the background there. Okay, next slide. So so just going through the building blocks, okay. So protein. 
what makes protein what makes a protein a protein it's made up of long chains of amino acids which are sort of knitted together amino acids consist of an amino group which is this group over here and a carboxyl group and then a side chain which gives us its unique characteristic okay so why is that important it's because how our proteins metabolize so you eat pro a protein meal or you eat proteins enterally in your gut they get broken down to amino acids which your body then absorbs and then makes into proteins in your body okay but your body also says that look just go back to the other slide. <laughs> so your body also says that if you know I've, I've got lots of amino acids uh, and um, you know, but but I don't have enough energy. So what I'll do is I'll lock off the amino group and weed that out as ammonia and urea in the urine, and I'll use that carbon skeleton as energy. Okay, and this means that you can only use your amino acid to make all the special components your body needs: proteins, catecholamines, blah blah blah, whatever if you have enough energy okay so unless you accompany each gram of amino acid with 25 kilocalories of non-nitrogen energy you will not be able to utilize that amino acid for growth okay it will kind of go to waste and it will add onto the sort of renal solid load um and which is already you know it's a renal solid so that's renal function is already quite different okay sorry next slide Sorry, I just um, want to apologise. My curse is very sensitive today, and so I've been jumping in, so I'm really sorry about that. Okay. I don't know where you're I'll see. I'll troubleshoot later after the talk, but I'm not. I'm not jumping ahead or anything like that. So yeah, apologise. Sorry. Um, so, so basically, uh, amino acids, as we said, you need in order to get to a sort of positive nitrogen balance, you need one and a half grams per kilogram per day, and you need 25 to 30 kilocalories per kilogram per day of non protein energy in order to be able to use those one and a half grams of amino acid a day. In order for you to grow, i.e., not just level pegging, um, you, you need to have as much as three grams per kilogram per day of amino acid. 90 calories per kilogram per day in order to mimic your in utero growth and we also think that when you when we've looked at sort of um, um, balance studies for fetus in utero we also think that uh, fetuses in utero can get up to three and a half to four grams of amino acids per day across the placenta and then there's no way that we can sort of mimic that really safely for for our babies uh, right at the moment um so next slide um, so, what does NICE say? So, NICE says, for preterm baby, you give amino acids as follow, fo follows. In the first four days after birth, you give a starting range of one and a half to two, and then you gradually increase this, for example, over four days, to give a maintenance range of three to four. Um, if you restart your parental nutrition more than four days after birth, you don't have to go back to the beginning. Okay, so lots of people go, oh, uh, we're not a mouse because we were a little bit worried about this or that and other thing. And, um, you know, we restarted at the PN and we started at a very, you know, one gram of per kilogram per day of amino acid. You don't need to, you can go back to your maintenance requirements. Okay. Term babies, um, if you start and uh, you, you give a starting range of one to two, and your maximum, as we said before, is less than for preterm babies, it's two and a half to three. And again, if you start after a gap, you can restart at maintenance and you don't have to go back to your starting regime. Right. Um, so, amino acids is not just about quantity but also about quality so if you could imagine that if you've got uh, a certain amino acids that you need to build a particular protein in a baby's body um, and you're missing just one of them that protein can't be made um, uh, we know that essential amino acids are those which can't be synthesized by, by people and therefore you have to have them as part of your intake but the list of essential amino acids for preterm infants is longer than it is for you know term infants and older children um, so um, the mixture of amino acids that you give preterm babies 
is really important. And sadly, at the moment, we've got two available to us, which is primine and vamine, and one of them is based on the monatogram of uh, milk, breast milk, and the other is based on the monatogram of cord blood. I can't remember which way round it goes now, but you can you can see from, from that, that that neither one of those is ideal uh, in terms of uh, for babies and the way they grow. And I think the next sort of area of PN research would be to try and define more optimum uh, sort of mixtures of amino acids that, that will really help our babies to grow. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so our next major building block is glucose. And as we said, in fetal life, about five grams per gram per day crosses the placenta, um, and that's by facilitated diffusion. So if the maternal blood glucose is high, you get more glucose coming across, leads you to macrodomia you have an infant of a diabetic mother. Glucose is your major portion of your calories in your parental nutrition solution, but if you give too much glucose, that also leads to problems, and that leads to, as we know, hyperglycemia, um, you uh, lay down extra fat tissue, and you get increased CO2 production. When you have increased CO2 production, somebody's going to want to turn up your ventilator, okay, which, is, which is not good for you. Um, so um, you try not to go above your glucose oxidation rate. Let's skip the slide. Yeah. So glucose oxidation rate, the maximum in preterm infants is about nine to twelve grams per kilo per day, and the maximum glucose oxidation rate in term infants, we think, all the papers suggest about eighteen grams per kilogram per day, but actually nobody goes much above thirteen milligrams, thirteen grams per kilogram per day. Okay. Um, and this is what's in, sorry, just to go back one more, sorry, uh, is this, um, th this is what's in SCAMP. SCAMP contains about 8.9 to 12 grams per kilogram per day of glucose, uh, depending on which, which level of maintenance fluid you, you are using, and NEON gives about 8.6. The SCAMP is slightly more generous on, on, uh, on glucose delivery. Next slide. So coming to lipids, uh, these are my favorite components. As you can see, you have lipids are basically a, a three carbon backbone, which is glycerol, and then you have a fatty acid, which is kind of married to the glycerol. And the fatty acid is what gives that particular lipid its characteristic. You've got a fatty acid with a double bond. That means that that's um, I think in the in the chain, and that means that those layers of fatty acids are less tightly packed, and they tend to be sort of liquid at room temperature, like olive oil. So that's an unsaturated fat. If you've got butter, you, that's uh, saturated fat, and they're sort of more tightly packed, and um, you know, uh, um, sort of unsaturated fats are meant to be better for you than saturated fat. The essential fatty acids that you need are your carbon-18 fatty acids, if we just go back to the previous slide, um, which is essentially where you have um, 18 carbon atoms in your fatty acid chain. Okay, and the two different ones you need are linoleic acid, which is your omega-6, and linolenic acid, which is your omega-3 uh, fatty And uh, you can kind of, as a grown-up, you can make everything else from those from those precursors, which is great because those two precursors are widely available in the food chain. It's very difficult to go without them. Um, obviously for preterm infants, it's a much more difficult story because um, it's much more difficult for preterm infants to make a long chain polyunsaturated fats that they need for retinal and brain development, i.e. DHA and arachidonic acid, um, from the carbon-18 precursor. Okay, so it's a much more difficult process for them. Um, so thinking is that we could probably do with giving uh, preterm infants some of those long-chain fatty acids as a preformed component. Okay, uh, next slide. Um, so what's the deal about omega-3 and omega-6? This, this is what this slide is, is about. So essentially, um, uh, omega-6 fatty acids are the ones over here in this little little line here you make them from um, the carbon 18 precursor and you produce dha which is important for brain and retinal function in preterm infants but and this but the omega-3 at uh, the omega-6 um, pathway is a competitive pathway okay so the more traffic there is down this pathway the less there is down this pathway okay why is that important is that because um, omega-3 fatty acids 
um, along the pathway, they produce anti-inflammatory cotinoids, okay, which are important in the prevention of cardiovascular diseases and old people diseases. And um, omega-6 uh, fatty acids produce pro-inflammatory cotinoids. And we think that uh, populations of people who eat large amounts of omega-3 uh, have less a less incidence of cardiovascular disease long-term, okay. Uh, we also know, for example, that certain diets, uh, for example, the American diet, is really, really unbalanced unbal apropos sort of omega-3 and omega-6, with very low amounts of omega-3. And preformed long-chain omega-3 uh, fatty acids, which is so important for our preterm babies in terms of brain and retinal development, are found mainly in marine food chain. Okay, so there's one, th one school of thinking which says that um, people didn't get to be smart until they started to eat in the marine food chain. So, you know, we used to be Neanderthals and just eat prairie wolves and we weren't particularly smart. And then we moved to the coast and started to eat marine animals and had more um, omega-3 long chain fatty acids, which helped our brain to grow. And therefore we are now the smart cookies that we are. Okay, next slide. So, What's, what's the big thing with lipids? So you can get essential fatty acid deficiency within two to three days if you're a preterm infant, if you're not receiving lipids. So neonatologists are really fond of stopping lipid infusions. Okay, all oh, the babies respiratory status is not so good. Let's stop the lipids. Oh, there's a bit of infection. Let's stop the lipid. Okay, so really, really try not to do that because within two to three days, you will have an essential fatty acid deficiency. You can meet your minimum requirement by having a quarter of a gram per kilogram per day of, of um, insulin, for example, which will give you linoleic acid. Okay. So you don't need a lot, but you do need a bit. Okay, next slide. So we have a number of different lipid uh, preparations available to us. Most of us are familiar with intralipids, with clinoleic, SMOF lipids, and some of us are familiar with om omegavin. And so how do they sort of work out? Intralipid is a soybean um, uh, oil-based uh, substance, whereas clinoleic and SMOF are, um, is, are all balanced preparations. And the numbers really to look at is how much fish oil is there in each of them. Okay, so in SMOF lipids, you've got one and a half over here, and in omegavin, you've got 10. So why is fish oil important? Oil is a source of those long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids that we talk about, the DHAs, which is so, and the EPA, which is really important for retinal and brain development. Okay. And we talked about the fact that these were conditionally essential in preterm infant, infant. So it kind of makes sense to want to put them in a, in a lipid preparation that you're going to give to preterm infants. Um, so there was a, a, a meta-analysis done by Flyerdinger Book in 2011, which basically tried to compare all of these lipids and found a weak favorable association between less sepsis if you use a balanced lipid uh, preparation rather than a soybean only. This is the latest uh, sort of comparison of, of lipid preparations from infants. It's published in 2019 and there's a Cochran review and basically compares every single lipid preparation under the sun compared to every other single lipid preparation under the sun for preterm infants. And hey ho, what did they find? They found that further research is required to establish the role, the role of fish oil lipid emulsions in, uh, for liver disease outcomes of preterm infants and the ideal composition for lipid um, emulsions for preterm infants. So, in other words, you know, it was the usual sort of more research needed answer. Um, so, so there is at the moment no definitive evidence that tells us that, for example, a balanced lipid preparation like SMOF, which contains those long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids, which I've told you are good for brain and retinal growth, are any better in terms of outcomes for preterm infants. So, it's, it's interesting to think about why that might be. And that I think one of the reasons is because for preterm infants, we actually use parental nutrition in a very limited window. Okay, so, so you're using it for the first 10 to 14 days while you're getting onto enteral feed. But for most of us, enteral feeds for preterm infants are composed of maternal breast milk. And what does maternal breast milk contain? It contains some long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. So there will be a source for these important long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids for preterm infants, even if you give them 
only intralipid in your PN. Okay, so the, the, the reason for going into some detail for that is that uh, for, for us at the moment, uh, at St. George's, for example, we use intralipid as our kind of standard emulsion. If we think we're going to give parental nutrition as our sole nutrition, okay, over quite a long period of time, for example, gastroschisis, for example, shortcut, then it is really, really important to consider giving a balanced lipid preparation okay, because then you've got no source of those long chain fatty acids that you need so, and that, that are so important. So for short term PN use, it probably makes not very much difference. For long term PN use, you really should be thinking about using a more balanced preparation. OK, next slide. OK, so a little bit about calcium and phosphate, which is the other big component of parental nutrition. So basically, babies in the womb, the last trimester pregnancy is basically about laying down fat and making it skeleton. OK, and you accrete calcium as a fetus at the rate of two to three millimole per kilogram per day, about two and a half millimole per kilogram per day of phosphate. And we cannot equal this with feed, with parental nutrition postnatally. We cannot equal this with enteral nutrition either. So it is really, really difficult. And most of our preterm babies will have bone densities at term corrected age, which are less than they would have been had they grown normally in the womb. Um, so the bone mineral density of, sorry, just go back to bone mineral density of a, of a fetus is impacted by um, if your mum is really thin, if they're smoking, and if there's calcium intake. And this, this leads me to my picture on there, which shows you lots of fizzy drinks. So fizzy drinks, especially the low calorie ones, are much beloved by a uh, teenage girl and young lady population in the UK. Um, and uh, they, what are they high in? They're higher in high in phosphate okay and that means that you leach calcium from your bones so we know that the bone mineral health of our sort of childbearing population in the UK is very poor to begin with anyway okay uh, because of these sort of dietary things that are going on um, so um, um, you know that those are the things which will impact how your that little fetus that's who's ahead of you Okay, so coming on to the um, next slide, which I've lost. <laughs> oh, sorry, just my, I, I told you my curse is extremely sensitive. I don't know what just happened. Um, sorry about that. So, so we're on this one. Um, so basically, um, uh, you will see a few preterm babies who develop hypercalcemia in the first 24, 48 hours after birth. Why, why is that happening? This is because of um, sort of a latency in parathyroid hormone secretion, we think. So essentially, a parathyroid hormone is secreted by the parathyroid uh, glands, which are you know, near the thyroid, and they basically work by what, what they want to do more than, in, what PTH wants to do more than anything else is maintain your calcium in a normal range. That is its sole reason for being. Okay, and it does so with two mechanisms. One, it goes to your skeleton, goes quickly, 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 release some calcium, we need to maintain the calcium, serum calcium. Two, it goes to your kidneys to say, please reabsorb some more kidneys, but that's a more long-term mechanism. And then it also goes to the gut to say, please absorb some more calcium, we need calcium. Okay. Um, so you, you've got a sort of fast and a slow mechanism that PTH works. And we think that in preterm infants, the PTH isn't fully switched on yet, okay. Um, but after that, your serum calcium will be very strongly preserved. Okay, and that brings us to the next slide, uh, which is which is this one here, which basically is um, so. Imagine that you're in a situation where you're giving your baby beautiful parental nutrition and a little bit of enteral nutrition with maternal breast milk, and really nice nutritional parental nutrition, plenty of amino acids, plenty of energy, so you can metabolize your amino acid. It's all going really well. But hey presto, what happens is you find you get hypercalcemia. And everybody goes, hmm, hypercalcemia. What shall we do? Okay, let's take all the calcium out of the out of the out of the PN solution that we're giving. So just think about the mechanism of what's actually happening. If you're having plenty of amino acid and plenty of, of energy, 
you, your body will then the, the fetal the, the baby the preterm baby's body will then be set to anabolism so it will make <clears throat> it will start making tissue in make tissue you also need to have um phosphate and where's your big store of phosphate your big store of phosphate is in your bones so you go to the bones to release the phosphate but for every um, uh, molecule of phosphate you release you also have to release some calcium so if you're doing really well on your protein nutrition within the first few days you may sometimes see hypercalcemia because your phosphate intake is too low but that's a little bit of a rock and a hard place because you uh, ideally what you want to do is continue to give your excellent parental nutrition but also give additional phosphate but how much phosphate you can give is, is, give is limited by how much sodium okay so for every uh, millimole of phosphate you will have to put in two of sodium and that, that, that is your kind of weight limiting step but sometimes if you get hypercalcemia because of your because you're giving such good nutrition you have to sometimes step back on the amount of amino acids you're giving in order to deal with the hypercalcemia okay that's the most probably the most difficult concept so vitamins vitamins are easy peasy the current recommendation is that all the lipids all the vitamins are added to the lipid emulsion okay this is what makes it even more important that you don't try and that you try not to absolutely stop your lipid infusion okay so if you uh, have a um, high triglyceride level and you want to um, reduce your lipid infusion that's fine try and reduce it and cut it down but try not to stop it altogether because all the vitamins are in there um we had uh, a few years ago a little baby who presented to our unit which which would look to all the world like NEC, a dilated loop to bowel, uh, um, acidosis, uh, lactic acidosis, uh, baby went to theater, opened up, pristine, nice pink bowel, and then the penny dropped that uh, we were dealing with thymine deficiency, second to the fact that the baby hadn't had any lipid emulsion because the hospital where the baby had come from, um, the baby had had a very on and off course with feeding and therefore hadn't had we had uh, a sort of amino acids and glucose and not lipids okay so try not to do that okay so try not to stop your lipids uh, at all completely and also try and get them back to the level where they should be going as soon as possible because lipids are a really really good source of energy okay great okay so these are a few key numbers for you to remember so for every gram of amino acid you administer you should try and give 30 kilocalories of non-nitrogen energy. So what does that mean? That means the energy component, which is contained within the glucose and the lipid. If you count the energy, which is contained within the amino acid, that's kind of defeating the purpose because you want to use the amino acid not for energy. You want to use the amino acid for building tissue. So that's why we talk about non-nitrogen energy. One third of your energy intake should be in the form of lipids otherwise and that makes sort of oxidation of lipids and everything else much more efficient so for a parentally fed infant less than 30 weeks you want to give, be giving about 115 kilocalories per kilogram per day and three and a half grams per kilogram per day of amino acids that is if your baby's sole nutrition is parental nutrition okay now remember that most of our babies not their sole nutrition there are a proportion of enteral, enteral feeds and a proportion of and for a parentally fed infant of more than 30 weeks, we need at least 85 kilocalories per kilogram per day and 3 grams per kilogram per day of amino acid. This is their sole nutrition. Good. So, essentially, um, nutrition is uh, really important, I like to think. Um, <laughs> I would say that, my favourite subject. Um, and basically, parental nutrition, the role of parental nutrition in the neonatal unit is really to try and sort of um, tide your baby over until um, enteral nutrition can be fully established um, and also um, can also provide really a life-saving route if your gut is going to be sort of out of action for a long period of time. So getting parental nutrition right um, is uh, really important and, and understanding the basics of parental nutrition is really important. I'm going to leave it there and see if anyone has any questions.